Okay, so welcome everybody. My name's Kathy. It's great to see you here today. Um, and I thank you for taking the time out to come to our author talk. Before we commence, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today. I recognise their diverse culture and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I extend these respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us here today. got a few questions for Christine and she's got her fabulous book to um to share with us all today so firstly I'd like to welcome you Christine thank you very much Kathy. you're welcome thanks for being here um Christine was a volunteer at Dress for Success Sydney for over four years and her first novel The Changing Room which I have this one was based on her experiences there she was a senior public servant for 30 years and now she's retired and she enjoys life's simple pleasures and is regularly involved in tap dancing, acting, painting and playing the flute. She also writes. Her latest work is the focus of today's discussion. Um, Goff and Me is a memoir of Christine growing up in Cabramatta with Goff Whitlam as her neighbour. And... We're going to have a little bit of a chat about it, so welcome. Okay, Christine, your book, Goff and Me, not this one, um, is hot off the press, so I don't even have a copy of it here. It was, it's only five days old. It's a baby. Um, as a result, many of us haven't had a chance to read it yet. Can you read a short excerpt and just introduce us to your work? Sure. Um, well, Goff and Me is, uh, as you said, very much focused on the impact on my life when Goff Whitman moved to my street when I was eight years old. And both in terms of seeing this amazing family arise, arrive in our street with their flat roofed house um, and the impact of his policies was on me. So um, there was an extract in The Good Weekend um, about Goff moving to our street, which I can read. I'm not sure if... Um, uh, the listeners have had a chance to uh, read that, um, but I could read that extract to begin with, uh, if you like. Lovely. The man who would become the most visionary and polarising political leader in Australia's, Australia relocated his family from Cronulla to Sydney South to a four-bedroom, architect-designed, modernist house in Albert Street, Cabramatta. It was 1957 and their house was on the part of the street where new houses with curbs and guttering were replacing the vineyards and market gardens. I lived at the other end of the street, which was a dirt road in a two bedroom fibro house built by my truck driver fa father. I see those toffs the Whitlam's have moved into the fancy house with the flat roof, said dad at dinner one night. Dad, Mum, my sister and I were sitting at our scrubbed pine kitchen table with its red legs. My mind raced with questions. What's a toff? Who are the Whitlands? Eager to catch Dad's attention, I piped up with the next question that entered my head. Who'd live in a house with a flat roof? As I thought, how does the water get off a flat roof? I looked at Dad. He sucked the marrow from his chop and wiped his fingers on the napkin. It's Gough Whitlam, he said. Our new local member has moved here from Cronulla. What's a local member? I asked. Someone who's been elected to government. Dad took a slice of bread, put jam and butter on it and cut it into four squares. And why would he be so stupid to move away from the beach? I dreamed of living near the sea. The area has grown so much that two years ago there was a boundary change which excluded Cronulla from Werriwa. I tried to imagine a boundary moving like a fence. How did that work? Reckon Whitlam thought he'd have a better chance if he stayed in his electorate, which meant he had to move. Why do they live in a brick house and why is their part of the road sealed and ours isn't? <clears throat> I asked Dad. I was hoping to delay bedtime, which was only possible because it was school holidays because they're better off than we are, he said. So we're not well off. Dad grinned and looked straight at me with his dark gray eyes as if summing me up. Possum, he said, which always made me feel snugly warm. Just remember, there's many who are better off than us and many that aren't. 
What's important is to make the most of what you've got. Now off to bed if you want to be bright eyed and bushy tailed in the morning. amazing thank you so much and for everyone else who hasn't had a chance to read the book or that article I've put the link for the article mm -hmm. in the chat box for you to have a have a read of um so Christine why did you write the book um well I actually started writing my last story uh which you know was was kind of more in dot points and and um uh, a, a lot more backstory about my family and where they came from and that was fine uh, but I had a chat to some people and showed it to some people and I got some very good advice from a, a very dear friend of mine which said look you've got two choices you can either leave it as it is as a family history uh, and that's fine top and tail it copy it for your family and leave it at that or you can look at it and see if there's some way that it would work as a memoir. And a memoir is much more, I guess, a particular aspect of your life or a particular slice of your life. I have to say in the same conversation, um, she said, oh, and by the way, I'm doing a memoir writing course in Paris with Patty Miller, who is one of Australia's top memoirists. All I heard was Paris. It was towards the end of the year around my birthday. I'd been retired for a couple of years. I'd always wanted to go back to Paris. So I said, you know, my heart did a flutter and I said, okay, I really want to go to Paris. There was one place available, which I got. While I was in Paris, uh, which was in uh, 2014, Gough Whitman died. Um, and I felt that was a very special sign for me, both because he loved Paris, uh, he, he spent time working and living in Paris, um, but also because every fibre in my being resonated with the, the, um, the thought of Gough and what he had contributed. And, and a, a, a day later, uh, I had my one-on-one -on -one session with Patty Miller and we, we were talking about the book. And she said to me, you know what, you've act actually, you have to write this book and you have to focus on Gough Whitlam. You have a unique story uh, about him coming to your street and about um, some intersections later on in your life. Nobody else has that particular story. There are thousands of people who have golf stories and thousands and thousands of people who are impacted by golf, but only you have your particular story. So that really encouraged me to orient uh, the book towards uh, looking at the intersection with Gough Whitlam and trying to explore my belief that his impact uh, was both while he was in opposition, that he was a very good opposition member and subsequent leader. Um, in the three years uh, when he was in government, he made sea changes to uh, law and policy that have resonated to today. And, and I think his legacy does live on, as does the myth of the man. Yeah, and I, it comes through, especially, I've only read the excerpt, um, but it, it does come through that that this was a person who had a huge impact in your life. And mm. even so much as um, the house, I liked the way that you describe it. He, to me, that's a very unassuming house. But to you, it was um, the fancy house. Yes. Um, well, well, I think it's unassuming nowadays. Um, but even then, um, you know, we, we were living in quite small fibro. My house was a two-bedroom fibro house um, on a, on a quarter-acre block. So we had a reasonable size block of land. And most of the houses in our street were fibro. There were a couple of older houses that I think were weatherboard. So even building a house in brick was a step up, if you like. Um, and to build a house like that, that is a modern design, and we're now quite used to seeing that design. But in those days, it was groundbreaking. The other thing was that it was on the paddock. Uh, I think there was only one or two other houses in that paddock. So it almost looked like this modern spaceship had landed um, and this sort of brick four bedroom house with large windows uh, had kind of arrived. And to us, it looked both out of the world um, and, and quite fancy and quite classy. Um, and of course, what emerged from the house were these larger than life figures um, of Gough and Margaret Whitman and their children. And, you know, both of them spoke very well, both have been university educated. So it was almost like, you know, this 
people from another planet had arrived on our street. With them being in your street and the fancy house, was it really intimidating for you? Um, I suppose it could have been, but we were sort of inverse snobs, if I can say it that way. We thought we were pretty cool being, you know, working class kids and going around with bare feet and playing in the mud on the side of our roads. So, you know, I, th I think we had that kind of working class attitude that, you know, toffs and people who spoke with a plum in their mouth were a bit weird. Uh, so I think we had that kind of strange arrogance that sometimes sometimes you get. Um, uh, so I don't I don't know that I found them in, intimidating. Having said that, certainly meeting Gough Whitman did um, it was it was overpowering. And the first time I met him, uh, he was wearing his dressing gown, which um, is something that I didn't expect to see. And his wife Margaret. Um, so. The, according to the National Archives of Australia, and I'm just, I'm going to apologise, I'm going to read this bit. Margaret Whitlam played an important role as a political and prime ministerial wife. As an outspoken public speaker, broadcaster and columnist, she accompanied Gough Whitlam on his countless overseas travels. As a qualified social worker, she was particularly interested in social conditions um, and their public lives continued after they left the lodge in 1975. What, I mean, it's, it's in the article. Um, what kind of a role model was Margaret for you? Look, I think Margaret was extraordinary for me. Um, I mean, firstly, she was tall and I was very tall for my age. I was, um, you know, basically the same height I am now when I was 10. I was a tall, large girl. Um, and when I was about 10, I actually stopped growing up and started growing out. So I, I was very conscious of my body and the space I took up. And when I, but when I was in Margaret's company, I, I didn't feel that at all. I felt quite at home. And, and I think that's one of the things Margaret said, that she came to represent all those ungainly people who, who felt a bit insecure and they could look at Margaret and say, well, Margaret's achieved so much. And she certainly did that for me. But more than that, she was university educated. And um, I didn't know, I knew hardly anyone who'd been to university in the first place. But a woman who'd been to university was extraordinary. Um, so I think she she showed that women could do that and women could achieve those things. And I think she helped to lift our gaze. And, and Gough very much talked about the importance of lifting people's gaze, of increasing our aspirations. So we even thought, well, maybe we could actually do a bit better than we expected or achieve a bit more. And that's really important, I think, for children, that they can think about you know, where they might end up, even though at that stage I had no pretensions that I would ever end up at university. That just, I didn't even think about it when I was, when I was that young. Um, but I think, I think she did provide that kind of role model. And she was a very generous and caring person and she made a huge contribution to, to the area. One of the greatest things that we all absolutely thank her for is our swimming pool, for example. Um, I mean, I don't know how many of um, the people watching know Cabramatta, but it's in the Western Sydney, Western Sydney. It's a long way from the beach. It's hot in summer, really stinking hot. And we had no swimming pool. We could, the closest we could swim was at the local, um, uh, in the local river, um, which was not terribly safe. Uh, so Margaret was appalled at this. She was a swimmer. She'd been a swimming champion herself. She loved swimming. And she was absolutely appalled to find that the area didn't have a swimming pool. So she designed, joined forces with another woman, Edna Ryan, um, who was at that stage a, a councillor on Fairfield City Council. And they lobbied and they raised money to get us a swimming pool. And after that, she became, I think she was the president of the pool and of the swimming pool committee and the treasurer. And I went, I joined the swimming club. I trained every morning and every afternoon. And Margaret would be walking along the side of the pool in her black swimming costumes, blowing her whistle, you know, telling us all to kind of swim a bit faster or whatever. So her impact was extraordinary. And and lovely, lovely memories. And and in the article there's a conversation that you you relay um, about when you go and visit mm. and and it's it's very it's very encouraging and she says hello dear said Mrs Whitlam how are you going at school and you're in the top classes so good job um, and she's 
excellent. Keep up the hard work. Education is so important for us women. Mm. And Goff recognised that as well too. So he brought in a lot of reforms, like you said. Initially, like I think some of them he brought in affected you directly in terms of the street. So you had this, um, the sewerage system put on, you had... Yes, well, he, yeah. uh, that goes back to what I was saying about what he achieved while he was in opposition. Um, and while he was in opposition, one of the things that, that um, surprised, I think, him and, and, and also appalled him was that there was a lack of sewerage in, in western suburbs of Sydney, in Melbourne and Brisbane. And uh, he uh, lobbied very hard and worked very hard uh, with the relevant government agencies to get sewerage to our street. And that led to me getting a study uh, which uh, was modelled on Goff's study. Um, and I, I, there's an extract of that in Good Weekend as well where I visited the house and, and saw Goff's study. We didn't know any, anyone else with a study, let alone a, a home office. Um, I'd never seen walls lined with bookcases before. We had a tiny little stepped bookcase, you know, where my dad's, you know, bush poetry was and, and my grandma's dictionary was. Um, but to walk into this house and see this study, a whole room dedicated to study, and, and I um, was very fortunate that my father picked up on the queue and when he moved our dunny, our outdoor toilet, um, into an indoor toilet on the veranda, he also built me a study which contributed to my studies and, and to my, subsequently, my subsequent success. And um, your parents were very um, critical, uh, not critical, um, were a critical part of your um, your study process in terms of the fact that your dad built you that that mm. study made you work extra extra hard. Yeah, I mean, my dad was always building everything. He had wanted to be a carpenter, but couldn't because um, in his day, you know, basically, unless your father was a carpenter, you had no chance. So he he left school um, at the end of primary school, went off and was a drover for many years. And then he got a job as a truck driver. But in his spare time, he built anything he could possibly build, he built. And certainly building my study was one of those things. Um, and I, I keep reflecting. I reflect on it in the book. And, and I even was reflecting on it with some friends this morning about how my dad, you know, just an ordinary working class bloke, never once said to me, you're just a girl, leave school and have children. He never, ever said that. And I, I don't know why. I don't know whether it's because I didn't have brothers. I don't know whether it was because I was such a rambunctious child and, you know, they discovered at a certain age that I was reasonably intelligent um, or whether he understood what it was like to be trapped um, in, in, in the working class and not being able to get an education. But he encouraged me all along the way and I recount in the um in the meanwhile a couple of times or one time in particular where I wanted to leave school and become an air hostess and he just said over my dear body you are not leaving school <laughs> so I, I had a very supportive dad um, which was amazing for those times and you worked to really yeah, and, and you worked really hard too. You didn't mm. just get handed it. Um, uh, no, I've never achieved anything easily in my whole life, um, which may be a good thing. But I I mean, I know I was bright because I was told. They did a test because I couldn't work out what was wrong with me. So they did an intelligence test. But I had to study really hard to, to make it. Yeah, and you, you actually won a scholarship. I did, and that's another example of Goff's um, uh, importance when he was in opposition. There had been a report uh, that the Menzies government had commissioned at, and it, on education. It showed a whole range of things, but one of the key things that affected me that it showed was that working class children on the whole were leaving school at school leaving age. So they were leaving at 15, or in my case, it would have been 14. So they were never getting to university entrance age. So even though there were scholarships available to go to university, most working class kids weren't even going, getting to that point. And as I, and I was the same, um, I left school at the end of 14 because my parents couldn't afford to keep me on at school. My intention was to work and I was, you know, applying for jobs and looking for work. 
Gough Whitlam picked up on this as early as um, 1958 in his election speech at Cabramatta Town Hall. And he, he really, really pushed for the need for a scholarship, a senior secondary scholarship, so that poorer kids could stay on at school, those, those who had the talent. And uh, he managed to convince the government of the, of the day to bring that in. And I was one of the first recipients of that scholarship. As I said, I'd already left school. I got the scholarship. I went back to school for for the next, for another two years, and then I won a scholarship to university. So um, you can see that real impact that his reforms mm. have made on your life, and you can see why that Absolutely. that book, that memoir, is so significant both for you and for a lot of other people. Because mm. one of his other reforms he brought in was free education for university mm. students. And free education for university students was an absolute sea change in people's capacity to access tertiary education. Uh, so it wasn't just university, it was all tertiary education. And you just have to look at the statistics. I, was, I heard the other day that 58% of university graduates are women. In my day, I don't know, I think I say in the book what the figure was and I have to look it up again, but it was you know, maybe five or 10%. It was a complete sea change in the access for, you know, working class, poor children, children of diversity, Indigenous children to, to get to university. And it was a sea change for women who, who could, you know, follow their talents and get a university degree. Um, so it, it's extraordinary. And the number of people that I come across, and I know, I know thousands and thousands of people wrote to Gough Whitman saying, you know, we owe you our education, we owe you it's so much um, and he had such a strong belief in the importance of education for equality to to give people an equal chance and what a great legacy it is a great legacy I mean obviously that policy has been pulled back um, since then it was actually um, the Hawke government that introduced the HEC scheme so things have changed enormously in that time Although, as I did say to someone the other day, there is, you can still go to university without having to pay upfront fees. Um, you do have to pay in the long term, hopefully when you're earning an income. Uh, but, but that initial barrier to actually getting into university, which were the very high upfront fees, are, are still not, not there. So there's a bit of a legacy, but, but not that much. And I do know, and I say it in the book, that, that Gough was very angry um, when... Um, when that policy was changed. Yeah. yeah, I think that that that's the thing about politics, isn't it, is that you can put all of these things in, but they may not necessarily go the distance with different governments. That's right. But, but the, I guess the thing that I believe and wanted to explore, and, and I think I've proved it to myself, whether I've proved it to other people, is that nobody could turn the clock back on that. I mean, that sea change of expectation about young people that they could actually go to university has not changed. And the proportion of young people going to university now is massive compared to what it was. So even though the detail of the policy has changed, the intent of the policy still exists. And I think that's the real legacy of Gough Whitman. That you cannot turn back the expectation of young people that going to university is an option. Not for everybody, it doesn't suit everybody, but certainly for many, many more young people than when I went through school. And you studied at university, you got your, you got your scholarship and you studied at university. Where did you go from there? Well, I kind of uh, hit a bit of a... Um, uh, I had a bit of an interesting time. Um, I, I did, um, I left university uh, and I went to Adelaide and I did do what I had dreamed of doing, which was teach um, for part of the year. Uh, and that uh, didn't work out for me. I, I ended up having a mental health issue around that. Um, so I left Adelaide thinking I never ever want to teach again in my whole life. Did a road trip around Australia Partway around Australia, I landed in Mount Isa. I couldn't get a job. So I actually ended up teaching part-time at a Catholic girls' school um, and actually quite enjoyed it. Um, so by the time I got back to Sydney, uh, I was pregnant uh, with my son and I tried to get, get back into teaching through doing some extra study and um, I wasn't able to do that because I was pregnant. 
And you need to remember in those days, there were quite draconian rules around what women who were pregnant or had children or were married could do. Um, so it was, it was quite limiting. As it turned out, Gough Whitland's program saved me um, because I became involved in uh, the first International Women's Day, which was funded by Gough Whitlam. I became involved in women's refuges, which were also funded by Gough Whitlam. Mm -hmm. um, and my experience in the community meant that I ended up working in one of the programs, community-based programs that Gough Whitlam's government funded. And that sent me on a completely different career path. So I have him very much and his government very much to thank for that. He has made such an impact on your life. He has, yes. And how's, how's the book been going this weekend? Have you been massively busy? Yes, I've been quite busy getting some lovely feedback uh, from the Good Weekend article, which was great. Um, and I've got some more radio interviews to do. I've got another one this afternoon and one tomorrow. Um, and I'm up to Newcastle tomorrow night. Um, yes, it is tomorrow evening for a talk up there. Um, I'm, people are starting to send me photographs of my book in bookshops, which is always extremely exciting. Um, and uh, some of my friends are reading it and I'm um, getting a bit of feedback from that, which is always a bit nerve wracking. Um, but oh. so far people are really enjoying it. And, and I think one of the things, one of the side effects, I suppose, of this is not just the goth memories, but I guess my memories of what it was like to grow up in those days. And, you know, my friend this morning was telling me about, you know, the copper, my, we, we had a separate laundry and a copper that you had to boil everything up in and the, the, um, uh, the washing line that was strung across the backyard before the hills hoist came you know, and all of those memories of, of when we were young and what it was like to live then and how much change there's been in our lives uh, over that time in terms of living conditions you know access to things like a television which I didn't get to I was about we didn't get to I was about 11 telephone I think I was about 13 or 14 by the time the telephone came um, just the, the changes and the impact of that and and I do hope that that some young people get to read, do read the book and, and get to just see how much has changed in our lives, both in terms of living conditions and technology, but I think also conditions for women, which, which have changed enormously. There's still a lot more to do, but, but there have been huge changes. And are you still involved with the Dressed for Success charity? or Dressed for I am. Success? I'm, I'm still a volunteer. I'm not doing as much as I was uh, when I... Um, First retired, I was a stylist there and I was also heavily involved in the coaching program. Um, so I mainly do events support now and certainly any events that I can help with, I, I help with. Um, I do donate clothes, I donate some money um, and I do attend their events at a fundraiser. It's, it's a great organisation. It's, it's just fantastic. Mm. You are so busy on your retirement I'm, I'm amazed that you still call it retirement <laughs> well exactly I mean what do you do when you retire you know as, as I say in the book I didn't want to retire I didn't think I was ready to go but you know they, they kind of needed me to leave I was in the public a senior officer in the public service at the time and I was terrified absolutely terrified um, but I've managed to fill my life with um, friends and activities and and projects like writing and and certainly for me writing and having a published is you know it's, it's absolute bucket list stuff it's it's extraordinary and and opens up a whole new range of of um activities and meeting people like you and and um, people viewing today that that I wouldn't have otherwise done and I just think it's extraordinary opportunity and it does show what we can do in our lives we have such an opportunity now to to you know do have different strands to our lives which is incredible I love that you still got that that I've got that image when you were talking just then of what you described earlier on about is lifting the, the eye gaze up. Mm. And mm. I feel that coming from you very strongly. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And, okay, so I'm going to ask a little bit about um, Gough Whitlam. Uh, just a, another question that I had. So or I also found out about him on the National Archives of Australia as well too. He was the 21st Prime Minister of Australia and he was elected on the 5th of December 1972. 
And over more than two decades, he set um, out wide ranging reforms, which is what we were discussing. But his term ended abruptly when his mm -hmm. government was dismissed um, on the 11th of November 1975. And the dismissal must have been a huge, um, a huge impact on obviously Australia because it had never, ever been done before on his reforms and how did it affect you? Well, at the time I was working in a Whitman funded program, it was called the Video Access Centres. Um, and I actually was at work all day. So I didn't hear the news, uh, which happened late in the afternoon until uh, the person um, who was a community development officer who worked next door, who was also funded um, by the Whitlam government um, to promote community development in the area. And he came in and said, you're never gonna believe this, um, you know, Whitlam's been sacked. And I went, oh, that's ridiculous. You're having a joke. Like who, who would sack off Whitlam? He'd been elected twice, not once, but twice. In, in those three years, you know, what, what a ridiculous thing to say. Um, but then of course, as, as we listened to the news that night, um, it became apparent that it actually had happened. And, and I think everybody was just in absolute and utter shock. I mean, how could anybody sack a duly elected government? It was just appalling. Um, and I think more as more and more information comes out, and, and I've talked a little bit about this in, in the book, particularly some of the work done by Professor Jenny Hocking, to find out and uncover what actually went on in the lead up to that. Uh, we were told, Australians were told a particular story, which was actually not true. Um, there was so much hidden and, and we're only now finding out what actually did happen through the release of the palace letters and various other pieces of information. But then it was, it was just appalling and um, uh, people just, you know, stopped work, people went to rallies. Um, you know, I went to rallies, I, you know, in, in took my son in his stroller to into the city to, uh, I think it was the Botanic Gardens where the Gough Whitlam spoke to, you know, thousands of people and we cried and we, you know, clapped and and we just believed that it, it, it just couldn't, um, it couldn't, it couldn't have been true and it, it couldn't be sustained uh, and, and people were just appalled and we, we, um, obviously thought he'd be elected again and he wasn't and there's a range of reasons for that um uh, the economy was in trouble but also i think uh the way that the dismissal happened and the lies around uh what had gone on uh really permeated and i think the media also was was very much against Croft at the time so he wasn't re-elected um and uh we all thought and fraser was brought in and you know people were very critical of Fraser. Uh, he was called Coos Curb by many people. Um, but if we thought Goff had been a, a tough, then um, Fraser was the super tough. He was a grazier. He was very famous for his um, uh, saying, you know, life's not meant to be easy, you know, so you kind of poor and working class people get on with it and stop complaining kind of thing. So he was not liked at all. He was, he was feared. And in fact, one of the first things he did was uh, set up what he called the razor gang, which means going through government spending and cutting government spending. So I really thought my job was on the line. Um, as it turned out, uh, we, you know, I think we had funding for a year, but the position, the, the centres are actually funded through the Australia Council and Gough Whitlam had been very clever and set the Australia Council up as almost this autonomous body, separate bodies. So we did manage to survive for a number of years after Fraser came in. Mm. And I liked hearing you describe that, what it was like at, at the time, um, because I didn't live through it and I can see it in the history books and, you know, I can read about it. I can, you know, get media reports and stuff, but you were there, you, you can convey mm. the emotion and that's the difference with a memoir is that this is how you saw it, this is how you experienced it. Mm. Um, so that's, you know, invaluable. Thank you. Mm. Um, Connie has popped a question in. Um, what do you mean by the myth of the man? Oh, look, I, I think um, it, it's interesting when you think that Gough Whitman was a prime minister for three years. It's not very long. Um, and yet 
I don't know, everywhere I go when I mention Gough Whitlam, people have a view about Gough. They remember Gough. Uh, they remember what he was like. And I, I think for many, many people, his stature has has grown and grown. He's he's like a legend, I think, to, to a lot of us. And, and uh, I think some people have coined the phrase the myth of a man, that, that um, you know, he's kind of larger than life. I mean, he was a larger than life character anyway. Um, he was very charismatic and he was... He was uh, very committed and he was very erudite. Um, but, I th but I think both the way he got into government and the way he was dismissed have added to this almost mythology, I think, around this extraordinary person in Australia's history. And, and it just resonates, certainly resonates today. And, and even when I talk to many young people, you know, they, they've heard about golf. They know what I'm talking about. They've heard the stories. And, and I think it's interesting that it just keeps going on and on and for us to have have a figure like that in our history I think is fascinating. And Lance has asked um, could you tell us more about your teachers and your experience at Liverpool Girls High? Oh, well um, I think I said in the article that I you know I struck gold when I went to Liverpool Girls High. The reason I went there was I was from Cabramatta but I was on the other side of the line. Um, at the time when I went to high school Cabramatta High School had not been open very long and it wasn't large enough to take all the kids from Cabramatta. So those on our side of the line uh, got sent to Liverpool. So we had to catch the train um, up there. Uh, Liverpool High School is a girls' high school. Um, I know there's a lot of debate about, you know, are girls' high schools, are segregated schools better or not? Um, um, my view is very much formed by my experience. I tend to think that segregated schools do work very well for girls um, because they get more attention than they do in, in co-ed schools, um, that's not always the case. And it really does probably depend very much on the teachers and the parents. Um, but the other thing I was very lucky about is at the time Liverpool Girls High was what they called, I think they called it a disadvantaged school. That's the term I've used. And that meant that they had programs in place to encourage really good teachers to go to those schools. There were uh, promotion programs to the school and various things. So we had some of the best teachers, I think, um, that any school in Australia, in any school in New South Wales had. And I certainly had some excellent teachers. One of my teachers who, as far as I'm concerned, saved my life and, and set me on my pathway was a teacher called Miss Sue Pauling. And she was my geography teacher. I became an extremely good geography student. And in fact, she has said that I was one of her best students ever. Um, and uh, she also helped me when I had some emotional issues and uh, she, she was with me from second year right till I, I finished high school. Uh, she was incredibly encouraging. Uh, and I'd actually lost touch with her, and believe it or not, through this process of my book being uh, published, I've reconnected with her, and I'm so excited. I'm actually going to go and see her in a couple of weeks, and it, it just fills my heart that I can go and see her and thank her personally for her support. And I, I do know for myself, my teachers were just so important. Our headmistresses, I had two headmistresses um, in my high school. Our first was called Miss Trent Fisher. And she was very much like a, a girls' school and, and both her and, and the subsequent headmistress used to say, girls, you need to respect yourself. No one will respect you. And, and they really, you know, tried to get us to kind of lift our game and to and to feel like we were worthy and, and worthy of respect and, and, and uh, worthy of the education and they really pushed us to achieve. So I, I have only the best things to say about my teachers at Liverpool Girls High. So lovely that you've still got that connection there with your, mm. with your teacher who made a huge impact. And the geography aspect is nice because you, you can see it on the front of, front of your book is that your education led you to places where you never thought that you would go. Absolutely. So um, mm. travel to China. Yes, um, well, I lived and worked in China. Um, I, and that, when you read the book, you'll find out how I got there. But I actually uh, worked at the embassy, Chinese embassy in Beijing, or the Australian embassy in Beijing. Um, and an, in a lovely synchronicity, it was actually Gough Whitlam who set that embassy up. He was the first uh, Western leader to visit China and uh, he recognised China and that recognition of China 
led to them setting up the embassy. So I felt a really interesting kind of, again, circular pattern where, you know, he had been so uh, important in establishing our relations with China. And then I ended up working in, in the embassy in China. I thought that was a really nice synergy. I'm just wondering if, if you hadn't had that influence of Goff moving into your street, if he hadn't have been there and immediately on your doorstep, literally, um, would you have chosen the things that you've chosen? I know some of them were by circumstance, but would you have made the choices, say, to go into social work if you hadn't have had that influence? Um, It's always interesting, isn't it, to reflect on the sliding doors in our lives Mm. and and those sort of um, crossroads we come to. Um, uh, It's so hard to say. I mean, I I think for me the seminal thing was staying on at school. Had I not stayed on at school, I actually was successful in getting a cadetship into the state public service, uh, which had cadetships at that stage. It is possible um, that had I taken up that cadetship, I may at some point, with the changes that subsequently happened in education, I may at some point have um, got to university because um, uh, governments were, um, you know, were supportive of that. And as it turned out, I did actually end up spending quite a bit of my my working life as a public servant, albeit in the Commonwealth. So in a way, you know, maybe I would have ended up through a completely different route, sort of getting somewhere near where I ended up. Who knows? It's it's so interesting to speculate. But I certainly think that the change, I I don't think it would have been as impactful on me. if, if Goff hadn't moved to my street. Having said that, you know, he has impacted on many, many other people's lives who didn't live in Albert Street. Um, obviously, it's not a very big street, so not everyone who has had the Goff Whitlam impact or the Goff Whitlam, the Whitlam effect, as I like to call it, um, grew up in Albert Street, Cabin Manor. So his impact is, is way beyond just being a neighbour, I think. And has the book, um, you know, brought those people to you? Certainly many of them, um, both when I was talking to people about writing the book and since I've, I've written it, people are coming to me and giving me their stories or their grandfather's stories or their father's stories, which they hold so dear. Um, it's, it's just lovely. Yeah. I'm, I'm just absolutely amazed at the impact that, that one person or one family really has, has <clears> had on, on you and on on the country and um, mm. your book, um, it's its so very, very new. And I, I really wish you all the best for all of Thank your, you. um, for all of your future promotional things that, that you're doing. Um, we do have a copy on order in our library, so it will be arriving soon. It'll be hot off the press. We do have Christine's other book here, The Changing Room. So that's that's ready to borrow as well. So if anybody would like to jump online and reserve a copy, um, that that's going to be available. And of course, if you wish to purchase your copy, um, just check the independent booksellers on the Central Coast. A very, very big thank you to you, Christine. I, like I said, Gough Whitlam was before my time. And to me, this is such a personal account that he's that you've shared, Mm -hmm. it's just nice to see a different side of the public figure. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank Thank you you. everyone for joining us. If you have any questions, you can send us an email on librarypromotional at centralcoast.nsw.gov.au. Connie is saying that she had so many common experiences in place like us, so. They're out there. They are. There's a whole absolutely. tribe of you out there. <laughs> it's, it, it is, yeah. And, of course, next year is the 50th anniversary of the election of the of Gough Whitman as Prime Minister. So I'm sure a lot of people will be wanting to share those stories. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you next time. And a very big thank you to you, Christine. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.